super series that was held at Aekai Lamy two weeks ago. Freddy Furry on his 125 Kawasaki took the early lead in the 200 motorcycle category, but Peter Rigglesworth on his Honda, William Gillett on a Kawasaki, Jeffrey Volita on a 125 Honda, and Gray Brett on his Elna Fox Kawasaki 125 were roaring down the track behind him. Trouble for Rick Revo gets his 200cc Kawasaki going again, but at the front, Peter Rigglesworth on 201 was catching Freddy Free at a rapid rate of knots. Behind him, like an angry swarm of bees, the field was fighting their own battles. Piet Pinar on his 125 Honda felt just how tough the going was. But in a more serious incident, two of the back markers rode into each other on the very fast uphill straight, and with the medics having to come out to attend to the injured riders, the race had to be stopped. Fortunately, no serious injuries. On the restart, a tough battle for second position immediately developed between Gray Brett on his Elna Fox Kawasaki 125 and Jason Newton on his 200cc Honda. As they fought their way through the back markers, Peter Rigglesworth on his Honda extended his lead and took the checkered flag. So it was Rigglesworth from Brett and Newton, with Piet Pinar, William Gillett, Ryan Panikar, Sean Mel and Gavin Cowley making up the minor placings. In the open motorcycle category, the leaders quickly caught up with the back markers and the battle for victory had the large crowd on their feet. Ryan Hunt on his shell racing Honda 500 tried his utmost to get past the KTM of Michael Trussler, while both of them were trying to catch Gary Peterson on his Brasco Kawasaki 250. Peterson on number 260 sliced through the slower bikes like a hot knife through butter, while Hunt and Trussler had to do exactly the same to stay in touch with the leader. Hunt already had a win earlier in the day and was determined to use the advantage of his bigger 500 machine to repeat the performance. Having disposed of the back markers and of Michael Trussler, Hunt now set off to catch Peterson. The 500cc Shell Honda had the edge on the faster parts of the circuit, while Peterson's Brasco Kawasaki was more nimble through the twisty bits and around the slower competitors. Peterson had the bit between his teeth as he never even seemed to tap off, knowing very well that to do so for even one second, Hunt would be right with him like a flash. Hunt was riding like a man possessed, but every time he got close, it seemed as if back markers got in his way. Peterson was worried, looking back to see just where Hunt was, and the answer was, I'm right here, mate. Gary Peterson could clearly hear the roar of the 500cc Shell Honda behind him, but that made the highly experienced multiple motocross champion on Nebraska Kawasaki even more determined to hold on to his lead. The wide lines these two riders were taking through every corner was an indication of just how close to the edge both of them were going. Peterson muscled his way past Panasonic teammates Duncan Krauser and John Blichnote, successfully placing them between himself and Ryan Hunt who has also won numerous national motocross titles. But two corners later, Hunt got past and once again set off in hot pursuit of the leader. There just seemed to be no breathing space, because now Peterson had to contend with some more back markers. This gave Hunt the chance to close the gap again, and as he came up on the group, he used the power on his right hand to glide past and get Peterson firmly in his sights again. On the edge, motorcycle racing. This was the last lap, and remembering that Hunt won the previous race by catching and passing Michael Trussler just before the flag, Peterson threw all caution to the wind and just kept that throttle open as wide as it would go. But his lead was big enough, and it must have been with great relief that Peterson crossed the line less than a second ahead of Ryan Hunt. So, a first win of the year in the total Super Series for Gary Peterson, ahead of Hunt, Trussler, Peter Rigglesworth, Wayne Smith, Ian Topless, Greg Aspinall and Alan Julian. I had a demon start there. Because I knew that the 500 would be, definitely be a problem. And, uh, you know, like on short sprint races, um, it's a lot easier to ride a 500 because it's, it's not as demanding in 10 minutes as what it was in 20 minutes. I'm on a 250, but uh, I can't make excuses, you know. Um, I, I kept hearing Ryan's 500, and I kept catching the back markers very quickly into the race. Um, and uh, I was just relying on him getting caught with the back markers. Uh, all I can say is thanks to my sponsors, Brasco, and to Kawasaki for helping me and I'm looking forward to the next one and obviously to uh, Total for sponsoring the series. I think it's excellent for off-road racing.
from two wheels to four, and in the main race in the super quad category, a three-way battle quickly developed between Evan Hutchinson on number 70, Clint Buckham on 77, and Chris Jarvis on 58, all of them on 200cc Yamaha blaster machines. On these machines, the rider has to counterbalance the lateral cornering forces, almost like a sidecar rider, making it especially tricky to control under racing conditions. Another tricky bit is that these quads tend to drop their noses when crossing a yump, so the rider must pull backwards in the air to stop the machine from nosediving and throwing him over the top. Hutchison was grimly holding onto his lead, trying every trick in the book to keep Jarvis and Buckham behind him. But this time, Jarvis slingshot himself past the leader. Jarvis shut the door emphatically in the face of the winner of the previous race, forcing Hutchinson to check his line through the hairpin right-hander. Hutchinson tried a different line through the left-hander, but the attempt only allowed Buckham to get closer. Now it was Chris Jarvis who was determined to hold onto his lead, taking advantage of the fact that Hutchison and Buckham were keeping each other busy. But Hutchison doesn't take defeat lying down and immediately set off to catch up with Jarvis and fly his own flag from the front. Hutchison was clearly much faster through the left-hander at the bottom of the circuit and he used that advantage to force his way into the lead around the outside of Chris Jarvis. And that's the way they stayed, with Hutchison taking his second win of the day ahead of Jarvis and Buckham with Ricardo Giannucaru, Derek Robertson, Aubrey Kavanagh, Clayton Duplessis and Lynn Wilmot filling the minor places. Evan, it seems like you uh, started the new season the way you ended last season. Yeah, it's been a good start for us. We couldn't ask for anything more. Uh, bike's going well, the team's running smoothly. Um, yeah, it's been good for us for the first race, yeah. The circuit very quick? Fantastic. The surface uh, is great. They've prepared this track fantastic. Um, we couldn't have asked for anything better for Super Series, yeah. The Pro Quad category has always been the domain of Northwest farmer Vickers van Geventer, but after the first national off-road event of the season, the Queen Motorspares 400, this situation seemed to have changed. Not only did Christopher Namara beat Van Deventer in that event, but to crown it all, here he was ahead of Van Deventer in the main event of the Total Super Series meeting at Kailami. Even worse for Van Deventer, he was lying fifth behind this group, made up of Mark Breckel, Jacques Struwig and Paul Breckel. Van Namara on his team Joburg Yamaha Banshee finished second behind Van Deventer in the first race of the day, and he must have been thrilled to see the defending champion so far behind. The Breckel brothers and Struwig had a great scrap for second position, but this allowed Vickers van Deventer on his Jojo Tanks Honda 330 to close in on them. Struwig on his 250 Suzuki moved up to second in front of the grandstand. Lots of oil smoke from Struwig's exhaust and as he pulled away, Mark Breckel slowed suddenly while van Deventer moved menacingly closer to Paul. The exhaust smoke from Struwig's 250 Suzuki didn't seem to indicate a serious problem only gushing out in the corners, but a far more serious threat was Vickers van Deventer, who got past the stricken Mark Rickel. But Amalvin knew that he couldn't relax for a second because van Deventer is used to winning and wasn't about to give up this habit. That's Christoph van Amalvin leading, smoking Jacques Struwig in second position, Paul Brickel in third, and there's Vickers van Deventer rapidly catching up. But catching up is one thing, passing completely another. Over the short distance of the race in total Super Series, Van Deventer simply didn't have enough time to catch the first three and had to settle for fourth position. Christopher Namara took a very well-deserved victory on his team Joburg Yamaha Banshee, followed by Jacques Struwig on his Suzuki 250, Paul Breckel on his Brasco Phillips Rotax and Van Deventer on his Jojo Tank Honda 350. In the super special category, Yaki Yuber was having a field day, having won the first race of the day and now leading the main event. Fox Carolyn was second, but third place John Smith was losing his right front wheel. Robert Walk's super paved race car developed some early problems too, but he would get his car going to finish in the points. Danny Walker in his Sandmaster had Max Moore's WPP footloose to contend with in a battle for fourth. But at the head of the field, Yucky Ubaz Jojo Tanks 4x4 Beetle Turbo had its mirrors full of Bux Carolyn in his Haas Chenoweth Magnum. To 
defending champion Wolf Peter Fumfai was lying a distant third in his WPP Sturm Jager. John Smith's race didn't last long and he pulled off his Chenoweth with minus its right front wheel. Jackie Hubert was slowly but surely extending his lead over Bucks Carolyn, who seemed to have some kind of a problem and finding it difficult to find the right gear. Behind him, Wolf Peter Fumfai was lapping Max Moore, now the lone in fourth position, having disposed of Danny Walker. Carolyn in his Haas Chenoweth Magnum seemed to go very fast and then again to go slowly as he struggled with his gearbox. This prevented him from catching Yaki Hubert, who took advantage not only of Carolyn's maladies, but also of all the power and grip of his four-wheel driven Beetle with Volvo Turbo Power. Unlike some other more fancied combinations, Henny van Aert in his Alpha was still circulating, albeit at the back of the field, and he moved over to let the leader through. Brooks Carolyn was still lying in a solid second position in his Haas Chenoweth Magnum and he also left Van Aert without a problem, going around on the outside and still trying as hard as he could to catch Uban. Under his helmet, Carolyn was probably aware that he had a slim chance of victory unless something went wrong with the leader. But Uban kept it all together and he earned his second victory for the day. Carolyn was followed by Wolf Peter Fumpai, Chris Seneca, Max Moore and Rob Walk. You can The race that everyone came to see, the debut of the super trucks in South Africa, and these master machines didn't let the spectators down. In heat one, Cliff Barker immediately took the lead in his Penzoil Land Rover, followed by Cassie Kutsia in his Castrol Toyota Hilux. And all eyes were on the three creepy crawly Fords raced by Arthur Harkas, Paolo Tazza Musso and Charles Degener. Harkas slotted into third in his Hugbug machine, throwing the big V8 power truck around with gay abandon, with Piazza Musso trying to outdo him at every corner. Barker built up a steady lead in his beautifully prepared Penzoil machine, with Kutsia checking out the action going on behind him. And action it was, with Piazza Musso closing in on Harkas. These super trucks have been imported from the United States where they raced in the Stadium Off-Road Series and the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Championship. With at least five more on their way, including a new Toyota super truck for Cassie Kutsia, indications are that this formula can turn into a huge crowd pleaser this year. Cliff Barker still had a comfortable lead, but behind him the two creepy crawly Fords were homing in on second place Cassie Kutsia in his Castrol Toyota Highlands. Piazza Musso was still coming to grips with the power and handling of his truck, and he learned some hard lessons. That mistake allowed Klaus Degener to close in on Arthur Harkas, and although they were teammates, no one was going to give an inch. Harkas was making his comeback to off-road racing, and Degener has been around for a long time. Something had to give. And he did. Unfortunately, this incident led to light injuries to a few spectators, a broken steering box for Degener, and the stoppage of the race. Because of time constraints, heat one couldn't be completed, and the drivers lined up for the second heat. Cliff Barker once again taking an immediate lead over Cassie Kutsia. Degener was out for the day following his altercation with Harkers who was lying third ahead of Linton Draper in his Chevy. These drivers and vehicles took a tremendous pounding as they thralled the crowd in spectacular fashion. Just how hard they work is clearly shown in this great in-car shot of Cassie Kutsia's cockpit. Harkas was now making his presence felt as he closed in on Kutsia for second position, while Barker was happy to let the two of them keep each other busy. 
With both of them showing the scars of battle, Harkers used the tremendous torque of his V8 engine to muscle his way past Kutsia, leaving the Castrol Toyota driver stranded with a broken steering box and himself with a punctured right rear wheel. Now Linton Draper and Paolo Piazza Musso in a scene reminiscent of Jaws loomed closer through the dust. Harkers had no choice but to let them through, and for the unfortunate Kutsia, well, his day was over. But there was more to come. Showing some battle scars of his own, Paolo Piazza Musso found that these trucks cannot balance on their outer wheels, and he put it on its roof. Barker continued on his merry way, and fortunately the damage to Piazza Musso's vehicle wasn't too serious, and after a while he was back on his wheels to continue the race. Barker took the victory ahead of Linton Draper and Piazza Musso, while in the production vehicle category, Mark Corbett beat Henry Zermatten and Dodo Boo. The spectators couldn't complain about a lack of action, and there was more to come. The main event, and Harker's slow off the line. Piazza Musso had a great start and immediately slotted into the lead, followed by Cliff Barker, Arthur Harkus and Henry Zermatten in his chef-powered Isuzu Bucky, leading the production vehicles. Behind Zermatten came Mark Corbett in his V6 engine SVM, Richard Leake in his Toyota Hilux, Joe de Boer in a Ford Courier, and Frank de Greef in his Volkswagen Beetle. Barker knew that he had his work cut out for him if he wanted to catch Piazza Musso, while at the same time keeping Harkus at bay. A great sight as these spectacular monster machines slide their way around the bottom corner and accelerate hard along the uphill straight towards the main grandstand. The spectators loved it and Harkers had no problem moving into second position. Piazza Musso had learned quickly how to drive his creepy crawly Ford Courier fast and was reveling in the conditions. He also found that it was somewhat different than the rally cars he was used to. Cliff Barker was coming under threat from Henry Zermatten for third position. With a little bit of breathing space, Piazza Musso could choose ideal lines through the corners while Harkers had to throw caution to the wind in trying to catch the flying Italian. Piazza Musso, who will be driving the Sassel Ford Escort for the Scuderia Africa outfit in the National Rally Championship this year, welcomed the chance to hone his driving skills in totally different conditions. Arthur Harkers clearly had an advantage along the uphill straight and he was aware of the fact that if only he could get closer, he was in with a real chance of taking the lead. With some very slippery conditions through the corners and some drier patches in other places on the circuit, both drivers knew that the slightest mistake of braking too early or too late, choosing the wrong line or missing a gear shift could make the difference between winning or coming second. Cliff Barker had shaken off the threat from Henry Zermatten, while Mark Corbett was lying third in the production vehicle category in his V6 SVM. But he wasn't alone. Richard Leake in his Toyota Hilux filled his mirrors and Corbett knew he had a battle on his hands. To make things worse, the leaders were bearing down on them and this could have a substantial effect on the race results. Harkers was noticeably closer to Piazza Musso and both knew that time was running out. The races are run on a basis of 10 minutes plus one lap, which leads to the kind of spectacular action the drivers have been putting up and now they were heading for their final lap. Corbett and Leake were not only involved in a battle of their own, but they were acutely aware of the leaders storming up to them. This meant that they had to get offline if at all possible, but Piazza Musso was not going to wait for them to make room. He went around the outside of Leek, allowing Harkers to move even closer on the downhill run to the bottom left-hander. Only half a lap to go, and Harkers was faster on the uphill. Now, Frank de Grief, second in the production vehicle category in his Beetle, had to move out of the way, and Piazza Musso took full advantage. Harkers went flat out into the last corner, but to no avail, and a great maiden victory for Paolo Piazza Musso. Cliff Barker entered third, and in the production vehicles, Zermatten took the win, followed by De Greef and Corbett. Paolo, you seemed to enjoy that one, but it was a bit of a battle, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was coming to terms with the conditions, uh, coming to terms with the opposition, but I must say the creepy crawly 
Ford Courier handled extremely well. I put it on its lid once, but it survived it, and I really enjoyed today. You think it's the first of many to come for the season? Absolutely. The more cars we get, the better the spectacle, and I think it's really becoming a spectator sport.